Okay. Ready to roll? Yes. Senator from Oregon. Ask the quorum call be alleviated? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. The supplemental emergency package that we're considering addresses a number of issues, including, very importantly, the challenge of supporting the Ukrainian people. It also includes $9.2 billion for humanitarian aid around the world. And some of that aid will assist with the humanitarian challenge in Gaza. But I want to address that challenge in Gaza today in far more detail and argue that we need to do more, that we are so connected to the circumstances in Gaza because of our very close relationship with Israel that the United States has a moral imperative, a moral responsibility to launch a massive effort to address the humanitarian challenges in Gaza, to address the shortage of water, the shortage of food, and the shortage of medical supplies. We have worked conscientiously with Israel to try to dramatically increase that aid. We've done so month after month after month, but that effort has produced only a trickle of aid compared to the need. And the circumstances in Gaza continue to deteriorate. So the United States needs to operate or launch Operation Gaza Rescue, or give it some other name, but a bold and dramatic intervention in the humanitarian circumstances in Gaza. Let me be clear. Israel had every right to go after Hamas after the horrific assault by Hamas terrorists on October 7th on villages in Israel. But how Israel conducts that war matters. Hamas is Israel's enemy. The Palestinian civilians are not Israel's enemy. And the Palestinian civilians are not our enemy. Israel's approach to the war, however, has produced horrifying, unacceptable levels of deaths and injuries and suffering for those Palestinian civilians. That has to change. It's why I've called for a ceasefire. It's why I've noted, though, that ceasefire will not endure unless it includes the return of the hostages and an end to Hamas control in Gaza. I salute today the Biden administration's intensive efforts to produce a ceasefire, a 40-day ceasefire, and hopefully a permanent ceasefire. But yesterday, those hopes were shattered. And while such an outcome might still develop tomorrow or the day after, there's no certainty at all that it will come about. And it's why we can't simply hinge our hopes for addressing the tremendous suffering in Gaza on the possibility of a ceasefire. There's no guarantee when those negotiations will be successful. And with each passing day, the situation in Gaza is getting a lot worse. The Netanyahu government's approach to the war has dramatically increased the suffering of civilians. At the same time, they have slow walked the provision of humanitarian aid. Senator Van Hollen and I went to Rafa Crossing, Rafa Gate. We met with some of the most seasoned humanitarian workers to be found in the world. They told us about their work having been in Sudan and in Yemen and on the front lines in Ukraine. And they said the combination of factors that they saw in Gaza made this worse than any other war or conflict they had ever been at. The worst humanitarian catastrophe that a group of seasoned aid workers had ever witnessed. Netanyahu's government's war strategy has inflicted suffering on innocent civilians in multiple ways. President Biden described the Netanyahu government's bombing and shelling as 
indiscriminate. And that indiscriminate bombing has resulted in a breathtaking number of civilian casualties and injuries, now counting more than 27,000 dead, not including the estimates of those who might be trapped in the rubble. And this number, every few days, it goes up by another 1,000 people. And more than double that number, some estimated 67,000 Palestinians with significant injuries. And among the dead, among those 27,000, more than 18,000 women and children have died. You know, these numbers, they're just, they're numbers. They're hard to get your hands around. So think about it this way. If 18,000 women and children were lined up holding hands, they would form a line 13 miles long. Picture yourself going on a hike for 13 miles and with every stride, another dead child, another dead woman. Or picture it this way. If you were to spend one minute with each of those 18,000 individuals before they had passed away, it would have taken you more than 300 hours to have met each of them. And of course, it isn't just the dead and the injured. We see the huge impact in the form of the challenges faced by expectant mothers, mothers carrying children, mothers delivering children. More mothers are having miscarriages. More mothers are having stillbirths. More mothers are anemic because of malnutrition and that anemia is producing more postpartum hemorrhaging. More mothers are enduring C-sections without anesthesia. If any of you have had the privilege of being in the room with a woman delivering a child and imagine a C-section without anesthesia, you can imagine just how horrific that is. And of course, the bombing has had devastating impacts on the infrastructure, all kinds of infrastructure. We have an estimated 70,000 homes destroyed, 300,000 homes damaged, 1.7 million people internally displaced inside Gaza, 1.7 million out of 2.2 million Gazans. That is just an enormous percent, an enormous number. And that isn't all. Because so little aid has gotten in that hunger is rampant. Of those who are estimated to be at the highest level of hunger in the world, by far the majority are in Gaza as compared to the rest of the world, the entire rest of the planet combined. 90% of people in Gaza surviving on less than a meal per day. The impacts of that malnutrition also add to the impacts on new mothers in the form of women who are malnourished and cannot breastfeed. And if you can't breastfeed, you need to have clean water for formula. But the UN reports that about 70% of the people in Gaza are drinking contaminated water. Clean water is extremely hard to come by. And if you provide formula with contaminated water, then the odds of a baby surviving drop dramatically. On the medical side, there were 36 hospitals in Gaza before October 7th. There are 13 that are still functioning. And they are not functioning well. They're short of basic medical supplies like anesthesia and antibiotics, uh, drug supplies for diabetics or hypertension, the whole host of issues that they face. You know, 
the supply of food, water, and medicine can be provided through trucks. Before October 7th, 500 trucks a day entered Gaza. Over the last seven days, the UN reports that an average of about 170 trucks came in per day. It is not enough to meet even the most basic food, water, and medical issues in Gaza, meaning with each passing day, the situation is getting worse and worse and worse. Why so few trucks? Two reasons. The first is that Israel has set up a very complicated system to inspect the trucks before them. They had such an inspection system before October 7th, and they were able to inspect and allow 500 trucks a day to enter. But they've set up a convoluted system now that Senator Van Hollen and I witnessed at Rafa Crossing, where truck drivers, after loading up their supplies, often wait up to a week to get permission to pass into Gaza, a week. And during that time, they have to wait until they can go to Nitzana to have an inspection. That means traveling down the road and going into Israel from Egypt. And there, the load is inspected. Often all the pallets are taken off. They're looked at very carefully. And there's a whole bunch of items that have been pre-cleared because they are medical food and water items desperately needed. But at that site, the inspector may simply say, I'm not accepting that item. And then not just that item, but the entire truck is rejected. And the process starts all over again. Senator Van Hollen and I went to a warehouse full of these rejected items. They were medical supplies and food supplies. Medical and food supplies and bladders that you could put into the back of a pickup truck or on a flatbed to carry water and deliver water. All rejected. In fact, we were told about one of the items being rejected were kits for sanitary kits for assisting the delivery of a child. And I said, how could one reject a kit for the delivery of children? And the answer was, the inspector said, there is a scalpel in this kit, and that's a knife, and so these kits cannot be allowed. We have women delivering babies often without being able to go to the hospital because the communications have been shut down, but when they do get to a hospital, not even the basic supplies have necessarily arrived to assist the doctors to provide the right care in the right way at the moment a woman is giving birth. So if you make it through this complicated, bizarre inspection process that is designed to slow everything down, if you finally get permission to go through Rafa Gate or Karam Shalom Gate by the UN trucks going through a separate entry, if you get that permission, then the problem is, how are you going to get from there to the warehouse? How are you going to get from there to the hospital? Because there's a war going on. Bombs are dropping. Shells are being fired. Tanks are, are shooting shells. So you need deconfliction to be able to deliver humanitarian supplies. And who can deconflict? Only one entity can deconflict, and that is Israel. And Israel has refused to do so. So now imagine the, the truck comes in, the Egyptian truck driver says, now these must be transferred to a Palestinian truck and a Palestinian driver. And how are the Palestinian driver even going to know there's a truck there when the communications have been shut down? And how is the Palestinian driver going to get safely to the truck? And how are they going to get safely to the warehouse when there's no deconfliction? So of course, people have been dying trying to deliver the aid to the hospital or the aid to the warehouse. The failure to have a sane, efficient inspection process, which we know is possible because Israel was able to do that for 500 trucks a day before October 7th, in combination with the, with the complete failure of deconfliction, has resulted in a very small amount of aid getting in. That's the challenge. That's a challenge truck drivers face with broken roads and falling bombs and artillery shells, risking their lives as they do every day, but making it extremely difficult. 
For months, President Biden, Secretary of State Blinken, Defense Secretary Austin, other senior members of the administration have been urging the Netanyahu government to change course. They have urged the Netanyahu government to adopt a strategy against Hamas that does not produce this tremendous number of civilian deaths, civilian injuries, and massive suffering. And Netanyahu has stiff-armed the American government. Oh, he, they've made some little changes here and there, but the same basic fact, massive, ins, massively insufficient supply of food and water and medical supplies. I've heard how members of the administration, the top team, have had very testy, very difficult conversations with Prime Minister Netanyahu and with his other core leaders. But you know what? No matter how much we ask, no matter how often we ask, the same result, massively insufficient humanitarian aid. So, President Biden's request to change war strategies has been rejected. President Biden and his team's request to massively increase humanitarian aid have been rejected. And the circumstances get worse and worse and worse in Gaza with every passing day. President Biden and his team did the right thing by trying to urge Israel to make those changes. But the Netanyahu government has been very clear in the end that they are not going to do so. So the strategy, however well-intentioned, however passionately carried, has failed. And this leaves us, the United States of America, it leaves us in a terrible place. We are Israel's closest partner. The suffering in Gaza now becomes part of our story. It becomes part of our responsibility as Israel's largest supplier of economic aid. It becomes part of our responsibility. As Israel's largest supplier of military aid, it becomes part of our responsibility. As Israel's largest supplier specifically of bombs and artillery shells that the Netanyahu government has used in that indiscriminate bombing that President Biden talks about, it becomes our responsibility. And thus, if it's our responsibility, we have to act. The United States must act. Asking politely or asking urgently or asking passionately or asking often to Israel is not enough. That strategy, it has failed. That's why it's incumbent on the United States to immediately stand up a rescue operation, Operation Gaza Rescue to get that massive humanitarian aid in to Gaza, to deliver the food, the water, the medical supplies. It's time to make sure that every one of the 13 remaining hospitals, 13 out of 36, 13 remaining hospitals have all the medicines and medical supplies they need. We can do that through immediate and sustained helicopter deliveries. We can do that from, with direct deconfliction with the Israelis because they're not going to shoot down American helicopters delivering aid. And how do we know that deconfliction can work in that setting? Because it's already been done. Jordan has been delivering on repeated occasions assistance through air drop deliveries. If Jordan can do this, the United States with our massive capabilities can do so. It's time not just to ensure that every hospital has everything it needs, but to ensure there is enough food and clean water to alleviate the massive hunger and the massive challenge of citizens unable to currently get clean water. We know that dirty water will produce disease. We know that sustained undernutrition or malnutrition, starvation, will produce significant challenges, illness. The combination is terrible. Even before you add in the massive injuries from the, the bombing and the shelling, we can get that food, we can get that water into Gaza. It's a 40-mile coastline. 
we have huge assets that can deliver food and water from sea to shore. It is our responsibility to do so. We are at this point, because of our close relationship and partnership with Israel, we, the United States, are complicit in the starvation, the hunger, the thirst, the illness, the brokenness, the suffering of the Gazan people. So I direct my comments to President Biden and his top team. You all worked very hard to find a path through Israel to get the aid in, and it has failed. I commend you for trying, but now it is our responsibility, our moral responsibility, to no longer be complicit in this humanitarian catastrophe. We must act and act now. I encourage President Biden and his team, meet today. Send the orders to ships today to get offshore. Launch the plans today to be able to provide those medical supplies to those 13 hospitals. Prepare those plans now for sea to shore delivery of food and water. Communicate with Israel that we are going to do this because we will not be complicit in this humanitarian catastrophe that is ongoing. That we value the life of every civilian, every Palestinian civilian. We value the life of every Palestinian woman and child. And we, the United States, are going to act. President Biden, I encourage you not to only meet with your team to plan this, but announce it to the American people. American people are deeply concerned about our close association with this humanitarian disaster. The world is very concerned about our close association, complicity in this humanitarian disaster. So speak to us, the American people, that Team Biden will act. Not in a week, not in a month, not when the war ends, but now. There is no time to waste, and this is a moral imperative. It is the United States that so often says to the rest of the world, what has gone on here, and why have you allowed it to happen? This is an unacceptable humanitarian catastrophe, and you must address it. That's the United States talking to the world. But now we have a humanitarian catastrophe that is in our hands, our responsibility. And we have to carry that responsibility squarely, directly, and act immediately and boldly. American complicity in the suffering of the Palestinians living in Gaza must end. Thank you, Mr. President. Hey, Mr. President, I note the absence of quorum.